Uh, hello everyone, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. Um, today we are going to have an MRT in it third session. And today we are going to discuss the squeeze and excitation networks. Um, so, okay, let me start with uh, by introducing myself. So my name is Ajisher. Uh, I'm a board director and community lead at National in Tokyo. Uh, and also regarding my engagements, I work as a computer vision engineer at Browsing. Uh, Browsing is an AI fish, uh, social fashion app. And, and also I'm pursuing my PhD at computer vision lab uh, at, at the University of Tsukuba under the supervision of Professor Fukui. And sometimes uh, I give some lectures at uh, Tokyo Data Science, uh, which is executed by Mikael Fabinger. And so the, here's the outline of today's presentation. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the beginning, I will be talking about universal approximation theorem uh, and neural networks. And then I will be talking about inductive biases. And then we will start talking about the actual papers, squeeze and excitation networks. Uh, and then I will give some suggested links and also the annotated version of this paper. And, and then we are going to have a question q and session and also free discussion. Okay, let me start with the uh, universal approximation theorem. So there's a theorem called universal approximation theorem. And this theorem tells us that uh, neural networks are the universe, universal approximators, which means they can approximate any mathematical functions um, with sufficient number of nodes and with suffi sufficient number of layers. Uh, actually, this is very strong argument, and it sounds kind of impossible to approximate any mathematical function with neural networks. Uh, in reality, yes, indeed, we cannot approximate any mathematical functions with neural network, um, because uh, in order to have like infinite number of layers or like very large number of layers and nodes, we, we need to have uh, infinite computational power. So since in reality, we cannot have infinite uh, computational power then. Um, so this theorem sounds not correct at the beginning, but, but there's another thing, inductive bias. So inductive bias is um, kind of assumption we have about the data and we, we include this inductive biases to neural networks, which makes them Mm, possible to learn any mathematical function use, using uh, neural network together with the inductive biases. So here's the uh, quote from the uh, from the paper. I think this was a dissertation. The, the final meaning of bias we will consider here is inductive bias. Inductive bias means mm, all machine learning relies on some sort of bias. For example, um, Rather than the than a source of st statistical error, this type of bias can be taught as a set of assumptions being made. Uh, usually, we, we call it we call them priori about which possible solutions are worth considering, which should be preferred, and which can be ignored. Without a bias of this type, machine learning wouldn't be possible. Okay, so then an inductive bias help us to consider um, only subset of the choices. That means like instead of considering huge neural networks, we can um, consider the very specific neural networks to, to solve our problem. Okay, what if we don't have inductive bias? Without an inductive bias, um, actually inductive bias restricts our hypothesis space, which means and the basic task of machine learning would become impossible without inductive bias because inductive bias helps us to generalize and evaluate the models. And if we didn't have inductive bias, then the uh, data set we need uh, should be true distribution. That means like if you want to learn the cat and dogs, and that means you would have all possible images of cats and all possible images of dogs. So this is, since this is not possible, we actually need an inductive bias. So with inductive bias, actually, we restrict our hypothesis space. That means that is our neural network design depending on the data we are working on or we are on depending on the task we are working on. 
For example, let's let's consider two points in Cartesian coordinates, uh, point A and point B. And you want you want to make a model. You want you want to have a model to cross these points. And as you may already uh, think that, that there are infinite infinitely infinite number of models you can fit to to these two points because they can have any kind of model which can cross these two these two uh, points. And if you have an inductive bias that your model should be linear model, then the solution is very straightforward. You can just fit, fit a line. So this is what inductive bias means. And when you consider inductive bias and when designing the neural networks, you would need less data and you will need less computation. By less computation, I mean, of course, deep learning needs lots of data, but without inductive bias, you would you would need even more data. And let me give some brief examples for inductive biases. For, for example, Occam's razor, uh, it's a bias towards the simplicity. Or graph neural networks is the um, relation, relational inductive bias. It has relational inductive bias. Or recurrent neural network has recurrent inductive bias. That means like you already know that we are going to process the sequential input. That means your input is sequential data. And then you construct the recurrent neural network. And this is one, one kind of uh, inductive bias. And on the other hand, transformers in this case process the input in parallel, not sequentially. This is just for, uh, for the heads up, but I'm not going to into details. And uh, lastly, we have convolution neural networks. Uh, actually, convolution neural network is an inductive bias which added into the uh, standard neural networks. When we work on um, data with spatial di dimensions, then we already know that images or any uh, data with spatial dimensions has some um, nature, right? Um, like spatial structures. And then we can, since we already know this um, rule about the, about this this kind of data, then we can construct different neural network, which we call it convolution neural network. Uh, by the way, when I say neural network, I'm talking about this full connected layers, or you can call it multi-layer perceptron, or you can call it dense net as well. Uh, CNNs are a special type of neural network which have a pow very powerful inductive bias, and it leverages the special structure, um, like local connectivity. And, and this is my own opinion, I think. Uh, it, it might or might not be true. I think all CNN architecture designs try to enhance this uh, inductive bias. For example, ResNet's proposed residual connections uh, or attentions tries to emphasize some of the parts of the data. And yeah, and here we go. So we are going to discuss about squeeze and excitation network after giving brief uh, explanation about inductive bias and universal approximation theorem. SENet or squeeze ex and excitation network proposes some additional inductive bias, um, which considers the relationship between feature map channels and and also feature recalibration. And yeah, in computer vision, one of the most important target, one of the most important goal goal in computer vision is to search for the task and data dependent representation of visual data and we want the representation to be powerful. And on the other hand, deep learning is, about is all about representation learning, right? right? And when you have good representation, then you can do classification, regression, or anything you want. And CNN is a deep neural network, consists of convolutional layer, nonlinear activation layer, pooling layer, and at the end, fully connected layers as a classifier. And <clears throat> So this is the uh, standard convolution layer. And convolution layers fuse special and channel-wise information together. So this is your input, input tensor. And if you have filter size of two by two by four, you, you convolve this filter over this input tensor and you will get the feature map of this kind. So that means like when you convolve this, thing, this particular filter over the input Tensor, and you use fuse the special as well as the channel channel wise information in the output. 
And this sounds like uh, convolution layers already deals with uh, spatial as well as the channel-wise information, but and there's something different as a uh, squeeze and excitation network. Um, okay, we are going to that point later on, but let me give some more um, different CNN architecture design examples. Uh, representations produced by CNN can strengthen it, strengthen it by integrating learning mechanisms and to capture spatial correlation between features. For example, in Google Net or Inception network families, and they consider the multi-scale processing, like in, in a particular layer, instead of having the fixed kernel size filters, um, you could use different kernel size filters at the same time and then concatenate the outputs. This is how Inception family, Inception network family works. And on the other hand, there's another example, special transformer nets. Um, they specially transform the feature maps, not, the, not input images. And it makes it um, invariant to scale, rotation, translation, and warping. And ResNet are uh, considering the skip connections. That means you, you can just uh, map the identity of the previous layer to the next layers. And by doing this, you could train very deep neural networks um, and you could solve the gradient vanishing problem. And, and there's another very interesting example, which is networking network. And this was proposed in 2014. And they proposed to make small network in between two layers of convolutional neural networks. And so that this that small network, this network in the network, um, can consider the cross-channel correlations. Okay, after giving some uh, CNN architecture design choices, so what's the difference at squeeze and excitation network? Uh, okay, let me give some um, issues and let me mention some some issue. Each learned filter in any not any, most of the convolution neural networks operate with a local receptive field. That means in, in, um, in the first layer, let's assume you have three by three kernel and that kernel sees only three by three um, region. This is what we call it receptive field. And, and in the later layers, uh, your, your filters receptive field increases because of the previous layers and receptive field. And that's why, the, but in either case, any filter in the convolution neural network can only see the local receptive field. Uh, it can be either three by three, five by five, uh, whatever. And that's why it's, they are unable to exploit contextual information outside of the region. So squeeze and excitation network investigates the relationship between feature map channels and explicitly models the interdependencies between the channels. And feature recalibration, that means helps the network to learn global information rather than the local receptive field, and learn the global information and to be able to select and selectively emphasize informative features uh, while suppressing the less informative or less useful uh, features and during the learning process. And in the paper, they actually proposed squeeze and excitation block. And this is very great that it's very great to have this kind of generic uh, blocks, building blocks, so that you can include this building block to any um, existing neural networks and existing convolution neural networks. And CSE block inter intrinsically introduced dynamics conditioned on input, or you can regard this as a self-attention function. And we already know that the features in the beginning of the CNNs are mostly class agnostic and the features in the later layers are class specific features, right? And, and in SE block, uh, they also show that the class agnostic features at earlier layers and class specific features at the later layers, which, is, which means this SE block is very compatible with the current existing convolutional network architectures. Um, 
and squeeze an excitation block uh, consists of two um, phases. The first one is squeeze uh, and the second one excitation. Uh, squeeze phase is actually doing uh, embedding, embedding the global information uh, of, the, of the input tensor. And they do this by global average pooling. Um, and this generates as the channel-wise statistics um, with the shape of one by one by C. C cor corresponds to the number of channels. And local descriptive with expressive statistics of the whole feature map. Since you average pool the whole tensor, you will lose the special dimension, but that means you already like express all this uh, global information with with the single the, with the single uh, variable with the single number. And after squeezing the input tensor to one by one by C, you would have a kind of flattened uh, array, flattened tensor. And then in the, in the excitation phase, you recalibrate the, um, this global information. And excitation captures the channel-wise dependencies. And we are going to show how, how excitation works actually in the next slides. Uh, and maps the input specific descriptor to a set of channel weights. So you have an input tensor, you squeeze it and you excite it and you would have the output I mean, this part one by one by C on the on the excitation part, you would have a numbers, um, the, which is equal to the number of channels, and they th that numbers correspond to the uh, weights weight of the channels importantly, importantly. And Actually, the rescaling is included in the excitation part, but I just wanted to show it separately. And in the rescaling part, this part, you would have a one by one by C um, tensor, which uh, corresponds to the weights uh, of the channels. And you, you have an input tensor uh, from the beginning. And the, in the rescaling part, you channel-wise multiplication between the scalar uh, and the input feature map. So you, you have one number for the channel number one and you multiply that number with the uh, input tensor uh, channel number one. And by doing this, we, we kind of have a weighted um, channel input tensor uh, at the output. Um, yeah, by doing this, we, we did um, weight the channels uh, of the input tensor by their importance or by the by the informative uh, information and squeeze an excitation block um, can be used as an add-on block for various CNN architectures so the uh, pipeline is like this you would have an input tensor um, and if, if you're on the layer one then input tensor means the input image you would have an input tensor and you would do the global average pooling, fully connected layer, uh, nonlinear activation, another fully connected layer, sigmoid and output. Here, I would like to mention some kind of, uh, some, some uh, parameters here. The reduction ratio, uh, when R is bigger, your, um, the small network here, you can, you can just, um, Recall the network in network architecture, and by if R is bigger than one, then you actually like put some bottleneck in between in between these two uh, layers. And sigmoid, and uh, sigmoid is actually used for classification, right? That which gives the probability distribution of your features. But here, the sigmoid is used to um, get the weights of the channels. And that weight uh, corresponds to the how informative the channels are. And <clears throat> another nice uh, thing about Squid SE block is it can be used at almost any CNN architecture as an add-on. And here's the example for ResNet. Oh, by the way, uh, regarding the inception model, uh, this is like input tensor and this is output. 
So in, in this box, you have inception module. We are not going to show the inception module here, but we are going to show how an SE block can be added to the existing inception module. So again, here's the input tensor. You have you done the exactly the same thing in uh, with the inception module, and open a new branch. Here, do the global all this stuff. This one global average polling, fully connected layer. Uh, activation function, another fully connected layer, and sigmoid. And here you, you would have a, like one by one by C um, tensor. And you rescale the input tensor with these numbers. And you would you go to the next layer. And the same thing uh, valid for the ResNet. You can, have a, you can have this input tensor. And this is actually the ResNet module you have this one and also skip connection. And here you can also put this SE block uh, by opening a new branch, doing, doing the same stuff and rescale this one and do the, do the rest as, as proposed in the ResNet. And we call it this SE ResNet module. And in, in this paper, they do very like detailed um, experiments. They try to put this, uh, SE block to different places, for example. So th the first one is this one with standard SE block. And SE prep block, it means do, performing this SE uh, block uh, be before the residual uh, module or like putting SE block after the concatenation or um, putting the SE block uh, into the identity map branch. But they, they decided that this one works better than the others. And here's the result on ImageNet. Uh, the validation set uh, error rates of uh, different CNN architecture and their uh, SE counterparts. For example, ResNet 50 had 7.8 uh, top five error uh, and SE. And, and they also re-implemented the paper. And according to their implementation and the top five error was 748. And in SE ResNet 50, um, it's 6.62. And regarding the floating point operations, it was 2.86 um, giga uh, floating point operations. And in the SE counterpart, it's like increased slightly, like 3.87 giga flow and floating point operations. And in this table, you can see the uh, different um, results on different CNN architectures. And they also performed the experiments on um, places 365. This is the data set challenge for scene classification. And basically scene understanding and task uh, assess the generalization and abstraction ability of the network. and they can show that the SE block can also contribute to the um, scene understanding tasks as well, which is very great. And, and also there's another problem, uh, which is object detection. And they do actually did experiments on object detection as well. And they also show um, better performance compared to the um, compared to the uh, standard architectures. Here you see the average precision at intersectional union uh, equals 0 0.5. And it was 57.9 and six, and in SE ResNet, it, it, comes, it becomes 61. And, and this average precision metric is very like um, robust metric, I, I, would, I would say. And I think this uh, gap between these two scores is very impressive. And as a conclusion, um, I'm reaching to the time. And as a conclusion, SE block is an architectural unit which proposes improves the representational power of uh, current networks, existing uh, CNN architectures, and enables the, to perform dynamic channel-wise feature recalibration. And, and also they shed some light on the inability of previous CNN architectures to model channel-wise feature dependencies. 
Um, and it may also help to advance the network pruning. And because like when you, um, when you can select the most informative channels, then you can just prune the others and it may help to uh, compress the uh, models. And the, in the last point, this is my own, own personal idea. Can SE blocks be used effectively during the test time? That means um, you train your model and you, you learn how which channels to excite and which channels to uh, vanish. Then I'm just thinking if it is possible to make the similar thing in test time. And that means like you have an input and your model would decide which channels are compatible with this input and then dynamically like choose the appropriate channels. This is just idea, this is just question. And we can discuss in the discussion session. And here, here's the some uh, suggested links. Um, and I think there's very great, and some of, some of them are very great blog posts. And there's also implementation. And there are some dissertations here, the special inductive bias of deep learning. If you would be interested in inductive biases, um, yeah. Let's go ahead and read this dissertation. And last words. So at MLT, we had a paper with annotation project in which we annotate the papers and share with the community. And fortunately, we have a, a PWA version of this paper, Squeeze and Excitation Network. And you can uh, reach the uh, PWA version of this paper in, from this link. And, and yeah. and. And yeah, this is, this is the snapshot of uh, annotated version of the paper. Yeah, thank you for listening.